Side above 3773 East Broadway, this is a live edition of the Jake Feinberg Show, Comedy on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app to your smartphone so you can stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. And we can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And, uh... Uh, what a high honor it is to connect with a guy who, uh, you know, the musicians, uh, it's vital uh, to create you know, spiritual music or entertainment on the bandstand. But uh, there are many people that go into uh, the cultivation uh, and the programming and the um, publicity and the promotion of uh, a given artist and their bands. And I got a chance today to talk to a guy who's I've uh, been looking to stretch the, uh, spread the word and, and also, uh, you know, inspire um, by um, developing good relationships with the artists and allowing them uh, opportunities to uh, perform uh, and inspire people, even in this uh, very constricted uh, time, not even before uh, pre-corona. I mean, we had, uh, you just look at the situation where you have Live Nation, uh, essentially a, a huge conglomerate now that's um, taken over uh, a lot of uh, venues. They've, uh, you know, remodeled them and uh, made them very formulaic, and they've sort of stripped away a lot of that regional authenticity that a lot of of these great venues across the country have had. And they also, um, you know, clearly uh, um, have a very narrow view of of uh, music and what will uh, what to bring to the people. But my guest has. Um, has been navigating these waters for some time, and, and now we're in completely unprecedented waters, and uh, he's learning to swim like the rest of us. Danny Goldberg, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hi, nice to talk to you. It's great to have you, man. You know, um, we have a game on this program called Name That Voice. I, uh, I'm going to put this in for you, and then we'll come back and break it down. Well... Look, it was a very collaborative era, uh, number one. And as I said in the beginning, you know, all of the various uh, um, people in, in, in the industry, you know, worked collaboratively. I, I, I you know, I, I promoted a lot of shows with the band and, and, and uh, you know, became very friendly with them. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the sense, you know, the, the, the sense of, you know, there was something happening, you know, it's sort of hard for, for this generation to understand because they've, they've lived through, you know, war mm -hmm. for, you know, the last 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. But, um, at the time, you know, in, in the, in the seventies, you know, the Vietnam war was still, um, you know, raging, and it was much more of a traditional war than, than you know, the kinds that are being fought these days. There are a lot of troops on the ground and a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, you, know, you know, my generation, you know, to a large degree, could never understand why the U.S. government got us into this war so many, so many thousands of way, miles away no real direct u.s interests other than trying to stop communism right. uh and and uh um and and of course we you know we had uh what what, what that generation you know uh um, really thought of a wicked president um in in uh in richard nixon um a guy who was you know incredibly uh, conservative, um, appear to have, you know, all kinds of ultra conservative views, um, sort of despised the hippies, uh, and, um, you know, the, 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 the recourse to that for this generation were the ta talented musicians who, you know, could write, you know, starting with Bob Dylan. Uh, you know, and going certainly to Robbie Robinson and the band and, and uh, you know, Garcia and Hunter and, and Weir and, and Barlow and so on and so forth. Uh, they, they kept the chronicles of the era and spoke, you know, spoke to the heart and spoke to a generation um, with the generation 
older than us just not having a clue. Danny Goldberg, you want to take a guess at who that is? My guess is John Cher. Danny Goldberg, one for one on the name that voice out of the box. Well done. Well done. So, I mean. Thank you. Uh, tell me a little bit. I mean, you know, I, I did two interviews with John back in 2015. And, you know, I wanted to, I'm just trying to get a ballpark idea of where you fell in as it related to um, what he was talking about. Uh, were you part of um the movement in my mind what made music so salient not even folk music just message music in general could have been instrumental music was that it was truly social consciousness music of the early 70s and late 60s and i'm just trying to figure out where danny goldberg was at that time um well i graduated from high school in 1967 uh, you know, I noticed you, you have a book about the Merry Pranksters. Is that, is that right? It just got birthed uh, two days ago. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Thank I you, brother. I wrote a book about the year 1967 called In Search of the Lost Chord. Uh, whoa, whoa. Uh, you wrote a book? Uh, on, are you, you kidding know, me? Uh, 1967 and the hippie idea it came out in 2017. And I'm proud to say the uh, wavy gravy had the cover blurb on it. Oh, dude, so uh, I, dude, I, I, I love. I, okay, so tell me. And, about, and so I, uh, yeah. I, I mentioned that because so I, I graduated from high school in 67, uh, went to University of California at Berkeley, dropped out almost immediately Jesus. and stumbled into the music business by the end of 68 when I was 18, just because I wanted to get an apartment of my own and not have to live with my parents. And, uh, you know, I got a job originally with a trade magazine, Billboard, just because through an ad in the New York Times, I didn't know anything about to do as a business. I just knew I liked writing and uh, that um, that I discovered then that that there was a music business and there were people who could make their living connected to artists even if they didn't uh, play music themselves because I had no musical talent I couldn't play the piano or the guitar or anything like that but I loved it and I loved I loved the culture now to just um, and, and and you know I started as a journalist and then became a publicist and then later a, a manager and I'm you know 50 years later still have a small management company in between I ran uh, record companies and, you know, happy to talk about any of that, but just to respond to what John said, yeah. I, I'm a great admirer of John Shear. He, he's one of the good guys in the business. I he's love him so much, man. An yeah. honest person and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a unique uh, character. And, and uh, I can understand why the Grateful Dead uh, trusted him so much in, in, in a long period of their career. But I would take issue with his description of Robbie Robertson and the band or the Grateful Dead as having any political subtext to their music at all. I can't think of a single uh, thing uh, politically. You know, in my uh, book, I researched, you know, the, the being, the human being in San Francisco in 1967. Yes. And what, what I found was that uh, Jerry Garcia, who was there, and the Grateful Dead played there, they played almost all the free shows in Haight-Ashbury at the time. They were, they were so much at the center of it, was very turned off by the radical speech of Jerry Rubin and Promise He'd never be part of anything uh, political again. And, and, and other than things they would do for Wavy, you know, because it's impossible to say no to Wavy Gravy if you know them. Uh, they, they, were, uh, they were not political, and the band never, I can't think of a single political sentence or lyric that they ever had, which, which is fine. To me, the culture and what we think of as the 60s and the 70s was a combination of a lot of threads i identified with many of them i was certainly against the war and i showed up at anti-war protests and uh, uh you know have been a kind of political activist most of my life on the on the left but but uh i wasn't turned on by the by the organizations that were sort of like sds that were movement the influence of psychedelics the influence of eastern religion you know peace and love and and i i found that music uh, uh, to me, represented the perfect um, meeting ground of these multiple strands of, of, of the 60s that not only had to do with opposing a specific government policy, which most of the artists I admired did, and, 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 but also to do with kind of a redefinition of what it was to be a human being, what, what was important. Were there other things besides what kind of college degree you had, how much money you made, what your job description had? Was there an inner reality? Um, to me, uh, you know, the, the um, explosion of the album culture in the late 60s and the 70s 
believe he provided the best um, artistic expression of, of what I was going through. Later on, there were some movies and books and other kinds of art that reflected it, but, but it was definitely a moment when, when music was really meaningful. And I was really passionate about the artists that I loved. So I would, as a critic, I would champion them, and as a publicist, I would publicize them. And as a manager, I would try to give them the best advice on their Um, first of all, Danny, just uh, in the last couple, just minute or so, you just kind of started fading out a little bit, and your your words are incredibly vital. So just make sure you're um, speaking into the microphone or whatever it is. Just I, I want to be able to hear what you. Yeah, do. I'm sorry. I think yeah, I had a plug. I, I'm no, now you sound great again. You sound great again. So it's fine. The, yeah, yeah, my my plug my plug got loose. I apologize. Do you want me to re-answer a question? No, or? no, 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 no. This is perfect. I I heard what you said. It was just kind of too 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 too. I, I want to make sure that we you know we get perfect sound okay. from, from here on in. All right. yeah. <clears throat> I'll just say this. I'm not even. Or there's no disagreement here. I, I, there's a couple of songs that Hunter wrote um, that um, definitely talk to the collective movement uh, of the uh, the dead. Definitely, definitely didn't want to be attached to any political message or anything like that. But Ship of Fools, uh, Morning Dew. Um, these are songs that speak to um, sort of the idea that I mean, there was this this period of time of collective unity at least in certain pockets of the country and um you can i I hear here's the bottom line i'm very close with mario cipollina who was john's brother um and and mario was 13 and uh what we've talked on several interviews and, and he said the real summer of love and i just wanted to know based on your research and your book if you've edited this the real summer of love was 1966 because that oh, was no question about it. I, I completely agree. You could, no, 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 let me just, and then I'll let you riff on this because let's just be clear to the audience who might be like, well, what is he literally talking about? 1967 was the summer of love. But at that point, everybody and their mom had come from Chicago and New York and they, it had been invaded by people all over the country. But in 66, Mario was walking around with a bottle of government, uh, made liquid acid and uh, playing upright bass in a classical high school at Mount, Tamapi- Mount Tamalpais and, and he had to drop out because the conductor's baton started to look like a fan blade. That was truly the begin. I mean, talk about 66 as being the real summer of love based on your, on your book and your research. Well, yeah, I mean, I think obviously it depends how you define the phrase summer of love. So, if you define it in terms of sort of the peak uh, experience for the core of several thousand creative people, artists, uh, you know, thinkers, and just sort of people that were uh, an active part of the culture, um, 66 was its peak in a certain way. Um, and the reason is that it became a victim of its own popularity and success. Right. And the inflection point to me was January of 67, uh, the event I referred to earlier, which was called the Human Bee Inn, and uh, you know the people in Haight Ashbury, particularly the publishers of the local magazine there called the Oracle, and uh, Richard Alpert, who later changed his name to Ramdas, uh, you know, uh, and and others decided it would be good to have what they called the gathering of the tribes, the different elements of the countercultures, including the Berkeley radicals, the musicians, different people into psychedelics from different areas. And 35,000 people showed up in Golden Gate Park. Prior to that, there had never been more than a few thousand in any of these so-called hippie gatherings. I'm not sure if the word hippie was coined yet or not, but it was <laughs> right. imminent. Right. So, <laughs> and so the media then uh, kind of ruined it. You know, on the one hand, it, it was destined for this energy to be transmitted globally through the media, the, you know, and, and, and it created... I, I was living in New York. I would never have known about uh, any of these things if it weren't for the media. But, you know, uh, suddenly this little neighborhood that really was comfortable for two or 3,000 people was inundated, like you just referred to, by like uh, by the next summer, 100,000 people invaded because they'd read about it. And uh, exploitive uh, people like, uh, you know, uh, pimps and drug dealers uh, – uh, gravitated to take advantage of some of the young kids who didn't know what they were getting into and 
and and advertisers were suddenly uh, trying to use the you know the fashions uh, of of, uh, of the counterculture and the language uh, to sell products and uh, you know it was uh, so the external symbols like long hair and tie dye and beads and like hippie language like hey man how you, you know far out yeah I dig it, yeah they right. were drained yeah. they were drained of meaning because they became just another sort of fashion statement and the inner impulse to be alternative to really uh, redefine what it meant to be a human being and to have a different set of values was was subordinated in the public eye to these external symbols so so it was a very brief period to me that's why i wrote it you, you know when when the sort of idealism was still bigger than the exploitation of it so so i think why people say so the summer of love in the public mind, what the media describes as the summer of love, uh, which kind of starts with the Monterey Festival in, in June of, of 67, was the end of something, not the beginning of something. It was the destruction of a counterculture. And it was, as the diggers said, you know, a counterculture, radical counterculture group said, you know, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was killed by the media. And there was actually a ceremony in Haight-Ashbury in October, by the end of '67, that they called the Death of Hippie, where they marched an empty coffin through the streets and, you know, symbolically wow. buried wow. this uh, this concept uh, for the for the for those in the know. I mean, it lives on in movies and sitcoms and sure. and all that sort of a thing. It influenced music. The values, you know, resonate to this day on things like the environmental movement. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley was created mostly by people that were inspired by. The hippie movement and so on, but but the uh, the the physical location of Haight Ashbury, and 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 the specifics that that created it, you know, self, you know, you know were destroyed by its own success, uh, and so therefore people look back to the previous year of '66 as this innocent time because there was no media; it was just a few thousand people trying to do something new without being self-conscious, without thinking about money, without thinking about being in the newspapers. So, so that's why the true, the inner summer of love was '66. The media summer of love was '67. You know, I've, I, I haven't, that, I, ha a, that, I haven't heard anybody. I mean, um, Barlow, rest in peace, who I've interviewed twice, uh, John Perry Barlow. He, he also made this allusion to. Oh God, I'm, I'm, I can't even do justice to it. But yeah, there was uh, that whatever um, sort of regional, uh, because at that point, you know. Uh, Big Brother, The Warlocks, your uh, Jefferson Airplane, uh, Quicksilver. That, in '66, those those bands had already kind of. I'm not sure if they had gotten albums together. I know Santana didn't, but they had definitely. The, the Airplane, the Airplane uh, released their first album in '66 uh, with a different singer. Grace Slick's not on the first Jefferson Airplane album. It was a woman named I think Signe Anderson. But so they they had an album in '66. But the first album by Jimi Hendrix, by by uh, Big Brother, by The Doors, uh, by The Grateful Dead, uh, uh, by Velvet Underground, by Pink Floyd, uh, and by Sly and the Family Stone, those all came out in '67. They came out in '67. Chances are they were being cultivated in '66, right? I mean, they're, they're correct. Yeah. So yeah. Of course. yeah so wow, you got to. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, so, so, I mean, like Ken Babs told me so eloquently and, and it's in my book, you know, in 67, like you said, with this torrent of, uh, people sort of, I don't want to say posers, but people that were just got hip to it through the media. They came flooded San Francisco. Babs said, uh, the original pranksters went underneath the concrete and went up to Oregon at that point. So this is yeah, my exactly. And a lot of the musicians moved to Marin County or, yeah, at one time, in 66, the members of the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane and Big Brother and the Holding Company all lived in that neighborhood. Exactly. And it's a neighborhood of like 40 square miles. Yeah, no, what I wanted to say was that um, this is the question for, for Danny Goldberg, and because it's and it's interesting, I, I, I wish I had talked to you before I published the book, but um, really the, the thesis, and it's not something that's, you know, uh, dogmatic in any way, but... I'm basically making, and I was born in '78, so this is all after before my time. But I, mm. but I, what I, what I, you know, Wavy and I have a, have a very deep bond, and I've I've earned his trust, and we have a lot of street cred together. And he considers himself a teenage beatnik. I mean, at the time, third stream uh, poetry, I think, came out on World Pacific, um, and, and he was still known as Hugh Romney. He was the first one to do 
poetry with with a backing jazz band. Uh, he had guys like Jackie Byard and Don Ellis coming up. So the beat. So tell me the, the explain to me how the beats and then the pranksters basically set the table uh, for. Um, my argument is this: that like bands like the Grateful Dead, because of the acid tests, which took place for two straight years, almost every weekend prior to it being illegal. Um, it gave them an inherent, it, somehow, an organic fan base already. Though uh, you know those, they were known as a hippie band for better or for worse, or, or a tripping band. And my belief is that without that infrastructure, the dead might have continued on, but it would have looked very different. Because it, there's, and, it, and it's proof in the pudding. Because by the early '80s, as the dead got older and started to, you know, sort of waver a little bit, that s, the, the, their audiences got younger. So I'm just curious about, in your mind, how you feel the Beats and the Pranksters, because the Pranksters consider themselves in between the hippies and the Beats, how they sort of um, set the table for the psychedelic uh, uh, music of San Francisco. Well, I uh, first of all, I'm just these are just my opinions, obviously, and obviously. those two people have exactly yeah. the same take on these things. And just to make it clear, although I'm older than you, I'm not old enough to have really been um, central to these events. I was in high school. I was mesmerized by them. It inspired me in a kind of form of my, my aspirations, you know, because I was coming of age during that time. But, but I only got to kind of know people, you know, a little bit later, you know, starting like 69 around the Woodstock period is when I'm finally actually meeting people. But, but you know, there's no question that um, – uh, Jack Kerouac, for example, I mean, uh, there's many quotes from Jerry Garcia who says, you know, he, reading Jack Kerouac was the bond between him and other members of the dead and and that and that formed, you know, the way he thought about himself. And uh, Dylan also in, in Scorsese's documentary, uh, No Direction Home, uh, talks about how reading Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, uh, you know, uh, immediately made him feel there was sort of an intellectual home for him. And that he, as he said, he wanted to be one of that. Uh, bunch. So, you know, these were some amazing people who emerged, just to talk about the Beatniks first, because, you know, they came of age and they emerged into the public sphere in the 1950s when the American government was far more conservative than it was during the time John Sher was talking about, or, or I would argue more conservative than it is today. It was the peak of McCarthyism. You had only three television networks. You couldn't even show a man and a woman who were married sleeping in the same bed in right. a Hollywood movie. Um, and, um, and uh, uh, you know, when Ginsburg comes along in 1955 and reads Howell, and it becomes this phenomenon, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, it's one, one of the very few uh, gays that were even out of the closet. I think James Baldwin and Gore Vidal were probably the only two others in the literary world at the time, and uh, just just an incredible um, uh, breakthrough of consciousness that that created sort of a, uh, a cult following, uh, you know, mostly at universities or in bohemian neighborhoods like uh, like Greenwich Village. Uh, so so that percolated to the point that when the next generation people like Bob Dylan and Jerry Garcia. Uh, are coming of age, they can look to Allen Ginsberg and Kerouac and others, uh, uh, you know, as 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 uh, signposts. And uh, it's no question that the folk music scene uh, also uh, had this uh, arc that that had gone back certainly to the 30s and 40s with people like Woody Guthrie and Cisco Houston and all that. Then there was sort of the blacklisting period that that, um, that excluded people like Pete Seeger from the mass media. Absolutely. And and they're in an underground culture similar to the poets. They're you know playing at children's camps or you know tiny little coffee shops but can never get on television or the radio or anything else like that. Mm. And uh, and and then and then the young Woody Allen and the young Bill Cosby. Uh, are playing in these clubs in Greenwich Village, the same clubs that folk singers were singing in, and um, and and they were they were all smoking the same dope, and you know often had you know similar you know went to the same parties and 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 uh, having all night conversations, and uh, you know so so uh, that that that. Um, you know uh, you know more about the pranksters than I do, and the unique odyssey of. Ken Kesey and his his unique kind of inspirational ability on on people, but there's certainly no question that 
that, uh, you know, Neil Cassidy, who was like a huge friend of Jack Kerouac's and, you know, the prototype for the protagonist and on the road was one of the banksters. So that's the link from the beatniks, you know, and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, the, th- the most amazing person in all of this to me is Allen Ginsberg, because he translated from one era to the next seemingly effortlessly. You know, Kerouac hated the hippies and withdrew and became kind of a drunk and moved to the right. Uh, hmm. you know, Gary yeah. Snyder becomes yeah. a Buddhist and, you know, meditates and is, is more isolated from society. And Alan is a major character of the beatnik movement, a major character of the of the hippie movement. He was the MC of the BN. He was he took acid with Tim Leary and with Ken Kesey. He was friends with the Beatles and with Bob Dylan. And then he continues on to be an important person in the society until he passes away in the early 90s. You know, he's like uh, uh, one of the most extraordinary people to me in American history in terms of the quantity of places where he had uh, cultural uh, influence. No, I mean, have you ever seen that? It's, it's one of my guiding principles in, uh, in journalism and, and dialogue is uh, the uh, firing line episode. It's on YouTube of him and William F. Yeah, Buckley. I- Correct. Fantastic. One it's it's, it's truly yeah. one of my, I mean, I like, I don't really, I am not, I like to navigate conversations and have people like yourself just riff and bring your own enlightenment to the table. But I mean, I, I don't read uh, voraciously. I'm not well steeped in like Kesey's work or Ginsburg's work, but I feel their, their energy. And then watching that dialogue, that conversation is like, I'm craving that authenticity. That is one of the most badass back and forths I have ever seen. And Ginsburg is just so, I mean, he deflects all this stuff. Like, I mean, he's just swatting it away with ease and he's doing it in such a beautiful. No, no, and he got, you could tell that he, he melted Buckley a little bit. He melted him. He melted Buckley. Who was one of the architects of the, of the modern conservative movement. One of the people who gave us Ronald Reagan and, you know, was, wrong in my opinion on every political issue but he was an intellectual and he did respect art and exactly Alan had so many different talents one of which was he had an encyclopedic knowledge of poetry he knew all of the older poets keats and shelley and william blake and wh Auden, and you, you, you know he he was a literary um savant in addition to all of his other things and you could see Buckley respecting that, you know. Exactly, he, he, dude. I lo- that is the th- that should be shown in every journalism class in the world. That to me is the ultimate in two people with with very different viewpoints. And what I did like about Buckley is that it wasn't like a zombie sort of like conservative that we have now, where it's just non thinking. It's, it's it's stick your head in the sand. After a while, he was so intrigued by Ginsburg's ability to, you know, weave in and out of this dialogue that I think he just was in awe. You know, it was just kind of like the most amazing thing. It's just one of the best. I just encourage people to do it. It's, it's to me, it's like, it's sort of a craving I have for dialogue in today's political system, but you know, it's turned into WrestleMania now. And it, I mean, we're so far gone. It's, it's a madness. Uh, I mean, we're, we're in a deep, uh, we're in an interesting and, and uh, fairly treacherous, uh, time right now but you know the, the, the going back to wavy because um wa- wavy wavy do you believe wavy wavy considers himself a teenage beatnik i think was wavy a beatnik you know wavy was wavy i mean you know i think he uh he, uh, he was, was hugh romney thinking, first you know, you know. Yeah, yeah yeah he was hugh, when i first heard him you know there's a station in new york called wbai which still exists but it's a different kind you know oh i know in, when it, you, you used 60s, to be yeah but in the late 60s, before there was so-called FM rock radio, you know, when I was in high school, there was this late-night show on BAI that was the only way you could connect with any of the stuff. Dylan would go on there and play a song, and, you know, there are many, many, uh, you know, uh, all the yippies would go on there and talk. And, and, and Hugh Romney was a regular on this midnight show. The guy who hosted was named Bob, probably as a teenager, at least knowing Beatnix. He certainly was friends with Ginsburg. But again, Ginsburg transcended all these years. And uh, he came and, and he, he was, a, you know, he was certainly, a, you know, he was there in a way that very few 60s people were. He was a little bit older and, and, and had a little deeper connection to the, to the beat, the uh, tributary. You know, he, he, I mean, and also like, which chronicled in my book is just the mere fact that uh, like at the Gaslight Theater that was run by John Mitchell, um, you know, at first it was, um, uh, 
Mitchell was steeped in poetry because of that was the beat time. And Wavy was one, you know, let's get a, let's get, uh, you know, let's get music behind, you know, some folk acts behind, um, or comedy behind the, the poetry. And I mean, he was really one of the first, I mean, he would open for Coleman Hawkins. I mean, it was insane to, to think that you'd have like acoustic, po- you know, bop jazz. Uh, Wavy was the catalyst for that. It, and he doesn't get a lot of credit for that. But he, there are albums on World Pacific that are like $40, $50 albums of him riffing poetry with jazz bands behind him. Ferlinghetti was doing that. Marty Ballin talked about going into the basement of his parents' house and they were celebrating the king and queen of Reno who were the, these famous beats. And, and, and there's Lord Buckley riffing poetry with a black jazz band behind him. So it was very, you know, it's, and, and a lot of those guys aren't here anymore. So it's, I mean, a lot, most of them, I don't know if anybody's around anymore from the beat era. So it's just hard to... It varies. David, David Amram is still alive. I've been, dude, I've, David and I are deeply, you know, it's funny, I, I've talked to him a lot but more about being on the bandstand in a jazz setting with junkies and whether it was yeah. an inside You know, here's the thing about Danny Goldberg, though. You, if I heard you correctly, you went to UC Berkeley, but you were, you were, a, Nor- you were a Bay Area cat. Is that right? No, no, no. I was in New York. No, no, no. I grew up in New York. So you, uh, but you went to college at UC Berkeley? I, 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 I got into college there. You know, I went to high school. You know, I, I, had, uh, I was already taking acid in high school. I was a uh, – mediocre grades but i had very high sats i was a good test taker oh, that's great and the, the person at the, my high school said look just apply to berkeley because they only look at the sats it's, it's the only good college you're going to get into because anybody who looks at your grades they're not going to want you so i'm not <laughs> sure if that was true but i uh, uh, you know i uh, mr brower i look back on him with a certain amount of resentment of uh, giving me such a limited suggestion but the truth is i i got in yeah. i went there and i only went to one week's worth of classes all i wanted to do was take drugs i'm not uh, proud of it and it's nothing i would recommend to anybody today but that's where i was when i was uh, 17 so i i came back to new york within a few months and and just entered the workspace so i had virtually no college education since i only had one week worth of classes that i went to uh but uh, but over the years i spent 10 years of my life living in los angeles i feel very comfortable in california but i i'm i'm uh, most of my life and currently i'm a new yorker well that's what i wanted to ask you because you i just wanted to be clear that you because there were some very interesting i you know i've done interviews like jerry grinelli who is vince garaldi's drummer and he wound up seeing cats from those bands that were all collectively living in the hate uh, around the time that you dropped out of Berkeley uh, at these very interesting clubs, uh, uh, people playing incredibly weird space rock kind of music, weird music. And I just wonder, when you went back to New York, um, did you go, I'd like to think, there's two things that I'd like to think I would be doing as a journalist if I was around and in, in a uh, as a career in the early '60s. I pray that I wouldn't have been calling Coltrane's music the modal music, hate music, because that was what a lot of journalists were calling that music. And then the other thing is, my dream is that I would have been going to the East Village to Slugs to see all these incredible masters of spiritual jazz playing hours and hours and hours at night and i'm just wondering when you went back to new york and got involved in writing and and that where where was were you hanging out in the bohemian enclave of the west village were you going to slot where were you going you know i i you know first of all i i I had to make a living you know and so I, i was working for trade magazines and then for rock magazines for the first few years so you know my my purview had it was pretty much about people who put out records uh in terms of my personal taste, other than just going to wherever I was invited to and what I thought was cool, uh, I still had a hankering for folk music. And so what happened in the early, uh, you know, 69, 70, 71 period is there was a guy named Sam Hood was running it. And uh, so, for example, the young uh, John Prine, before he got his first record deal, Chris Christopherson, uh, Steve Goodman, uh, and Loudon Wainwright III, those, those, uh, those artists... Uh, seeing them in a little club that that that, that was sort of when, when i didn't have an assignment uh or i didn't uh have a, a you know a party i was going to or something like that it was just like where do i want to go i i often went to the gaslight so you did go to the gaslight so i'm, I'm curious though like 
Yeah, but now when Bob Dylan was there five years later. Exactly. No, you're, John you're, Prine, yeah, you're, oh, so this is phenomenal. This is, yeah, exactly. Next, no, I, next generation. I get, no, it's perfect. I, actually, it's interesting to know with the gaslight. It was still uh, folk aesthetic. There was no trap drum set in there at that point at all. It was just, no, no. Yeah. No, no. So, you know, um, uh, I am curious, though, because the, the thing about that, you know, Bill Graham was able to monetize um, the scene because, as we know, hippies and as Mickey Hart said at one time, everybody in, at one time in the Haight-Ashbury, everybody was, a, was an artist and artists don't necessarily know how to monetize what they do. Um, Graham was able to monetize that region be, and do it in a very interesting way because, you know, he'd have the Sons of Champlin, uh, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band and, you know, Sly and the Family Stone all on one bill. Uh, three different types of music in a live setting. Um, and, the, you know, it was kind of an attitude like the crowd was kind of open-minded to it. But, you know, even if they didn't dig one thing, they might get off on another. I mean, I've Dave Liebman from Miles Davis's band said quite often that Miles's band would, would open one of these shows. And the minute The Grateful Dead came on or any of that hippie music, they, they were gone. I mean, they were, they were gone after the first set. But the point is, the audience's ears were huge. It wasn't like going to just a folk festival or a jazz festival or, in today's world, a blues festival where there's, no, there's zero black bands playing, right? It's just like very sort of uh, narrow viewpoint. And I know, like, in talking to, when I interviewed Tony Orlando at, you know, the Village Gate, for instance, I mean... I just remember like Judy Hensky. I don't know if you if you remember that singer, that folk singer, but she yeah. and she she used to do uh, uh, her live gigs. Herbie Hancock was on acoustic piano. And it's like this is, the you know, it was like this merging of music. And I'm just wondering if there was something that's to, even though you had a, a hankering for folk music, a lot of times, especially in that 70, 71 period. I mean, you could see a, a very diverse bill. What was the most diverse bill of music that you saw? I mean, Woodstock obviously had Alu Raka and all those cats. But, I mean, you know, what was inspired? Were you inspired by the fact that you could go somewhere and see a very different different types of music all in one night? Well, I mean, not quite to the extent that you're describing, but I certainly was a fan of the blues. Yeah. And one thing, uh, one of the many things that Graham did, and that the FM stations of that time did, stations in San Francisco like KMPX that later began, then later KCN, and you know that first couple of years of FM rock radio before it became corporatized, and and Rolling Stone was doing this too, was be, because they were taking their cues from artists like the members of the Dead, the Airplane, the Stones, the Beatles. They were respecting, you know, Chuck Berry and John Lee Hooker and. Uh, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, and so I, I had an ear for the blues, you know. So I, 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 I was, I, I was always excited to see a blues artist on a bill at at the Fillmore. Uh, you know, Graham uh, uh, was not a national promoter until later in his life, and when he was a national promoter, he was a little more conventional the kind of bills he did because that that was the gig. Right. But in San Francisco and New York, you had you know a highly educated subset of the audience. Uh, you know, it was only a few thousand people to fill up the Fillmore East or West. It wasn't like filling up an arena or a stadium <laughs> right, or anything right, like that. And right. it wasn't like doing this in a hundred cities. It was New York and San Francisco. <laughs> that was it. That's the Fillmore. Right. You know, it was a two-city tour. Sure. If you're doing a tour of the Fillmores. And, uh, you know, there was an audience that accepted that kind of diversity and, and learned about artists like, uh, like uh, you know, uh, some of the jazz greats that you're mentioning and, 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 and blues artists. King uh, Curtis. So I was aware yeah. of that. You know, I, I was certainly... Uh, I liked I, I liked the blues. I loved BB King. I loved Albert King. I loved Freddie King. I loved all the Kings. You know, <laughs> I I I, uh, I liked uh, John Lee uh, uh, Hooker, and I loved Lightning Hopkins. And uh, so those artists certainly were were uh, uh, I I loved when they would uh, be part of a bill, and and that was the culture of of the Fillmore East and West for sure. And then some artists, when they became headliners, would keep that tradition of. You know, the Rolling Stones having uh, I Can Tina Turn, so Charles Brown, you know. So, you know, that was the one aspect. I never had a great ear for jazz. I honor it. I respect it. I mean, I became friends late in his life with Ornette Coleman, one of the greatest people I ever met. That is, un that that is profound. That is profound. And, 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 you know, he, he, he was really a very important person in my life. But I didn't listen to that much of his music. 
You know, no, I, I don't like, either. No, like this is this, no. I mean, listen, I, I, my ear is getting deeper every day, but I mean, I have certain things that I can. And, I mean, I just get off more a lot of times on the musicians themselves, the vibe, and the essence. And I'm like, damn, if I could have seen this live. I mean, I, yeah, it, it, I just have a limited bandwidth in my head. You know, I like dude, I did. Chords. I like I like courses. I like country music, folk music, rock and roll. And uh, a smattering of jazz and classical that somehow gets through my limitations. <laughs> I wish I had a better ear for hip hop. No, man, it's fine, dude. It's all. Does. Yeah, no, it's cool. You I, know, I, there's no question in my mind that the music today is amazing, and it means just as much to young people as music ever meant to me. I just, I'm not young, so I don't hear it through the ears of, of a 16 year old or a 26 year old. I hear it through the ears of a 69 year old. You know. Well, actually, I would just push back and say I think that, especially as it relates to instrumental improvisation improvisation melodic improvisation known as jazz uh, i think there's absolutely um i mean i think that there's more there's amazing players that are coming out of these assembly line the the part of the reason that the time period that i love and covet and reached into the records and pulled out these people 1500 and counting is because everybody prided themselves on having their own individual sound most of them learned by ear before they learned to read you went to Juilliard, there was no jazz curriculum. They were making up the rules. And today, you're having cats coming out of academia with huge chops, huge facility, and you wind up staring at the wall or falling asleep because it's just like there's no soul to it. And so the, the blue... Yeah, I, I, you know, man, I, I'm just, I have a lifetime obsession with the concept that God doesn't turn off the faucet just because I got older. You know, I think that right. it depends how old you are when you're listening to the fucking music that most of us are most deeply affected by music when we're in our teenage years or early 20s. That's certainly the music that most deeply affected me. But just because I loved Country Joe and the Fish when I was in high school and I still get a certain feeling when I listen to certain songs on those first couple of albums, I don't really think objectively those are great fucking records. And just because I'm not wasn't a kid when Kanye West came along doesn't mean those aren't great records. I just didn't have the ears or the headspace to process it because I was a middle-aged, you know, guy, you know. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I think every generation produces great music. I, I know what I know. There's most music I don't know. Uh, and as I get older, I still work mostly with older artists. You know, the artists I've worked with the longest last 20 years is Steve Earle, who's my, uh, yeah, I, have a, I divide my time between managing artists and writing. And, you know, the management company is, uh, you know, Steve, who's, a few years younger than me, I think he's an incredible genius, and I love the kind of music he makes, you know. And yeah. the Water Boys, you know, same same kind of generation and some other people like that. So I'm really proud of those artists, but I don't kid myself that they're going to reach teenagers. Why would they? I didn't want to listen to my parents' music when I was a teenager. <laughs> um, tell me about um, uh, my first book, um, entitled The Cats, Volume 1, uh, on the bandstand of life with master musicians is, um, is article, is uh, excerpts of my radio interviews with about 24 musicians. In the middle section, um, I reached out to this cat. I realized at a certain point last summer I didn't have any peers in the book. They were all gray beards. And I reached out to um, Neil Casal and I said, hey, man, you know, uh, I'd love, I'd really be honored. Uh, you know, we did two radio interviews and, uh, you know, take a look at these excerpts. And if you're cool with it, I'd like him to be in my first book. And he was like, oh, he's like, man, he's like, uh, he's like, this is so hip. I'm, I'm down. And so he couldn't figure out how to electronically sign something on email. So he snail mailed me the, the waiver release form. And 10 days later, um, he, he tragically left us. And I was watching, um, I went to the West Coast Memorial Concert for Neil, but not the one at um, the Capitol Theater in Porchester. And I saw Steve Earle come out and, and give a, a great performance. There were so many great performances that night. But I recognized or I read somewhere that Steve wasn't necessarily like, you know, he didn't know Neil that well. Um, they weren't super close, but he was totally compelled to perform that night. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, why he was he was so driven to do that. Man, I, I, I just don't I, I just don't have a useful answer, unfortunately. But he's uh, you know he, he's he's a he's a Renaissance guy, Steve. You know, he's written novels. He's been an actor. He just nominated for a Drama Desk Award for music in an off Broadway play that 
producer of the public theater. He, he listens to all kinds of things. So yeah, he's in his own bag. He makes his own. You know, yeah, he, so, yeah. He just so, it was so, his muse. Know, uh, I, uh, nothing would surprise me about him. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. What was the um, uh, in your mind? You work for trade magazines, but can you? T- I mean, I'm I'm, I'm mu- very much into free form improv. I mean, this whole interview, all my interviews are like this. They're not scripted. Um, and I try to put, put people in a position where, it, you know, I put stuff in their wheelhouse, but can you talk about a time early in your career when you were given a, a real responsibility, um, didn't necessarily even have a lot of applicable experience to be able to figure it out and you had to improvise on the fly and it really set your career off in a, in a, in a real well, positive direction. Well. <laughs> I think that would describe my entire career. <laughs> yeah, but if it, over time moment. you get a reputation. You know, I'm I've saying when you were unknown. As I go along yeah. every single day, uh, you know, uh, I was so lucky to enter a music business culture where young people were needed because older people just didn't get things the same way 20 years later young African-Americans entered because of hip-hop, you know, being so different from conventional R&D. And, uh, you know, I had no idea how to write an article, do an interview, uh, Later on, I had no idea how to do publicity, and you know, I, I just I just tried to learn from people that seemed to know what they were doing and learn from my own mistakes. Uh, but but uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a website called Rock's Back Pages that uh, that uh, collects thousands and thousands. Of, they're based in England, but you know, they collect uh, all of uh, rock journalism uh, over the decades, and somehow. They, uh, there was a magazine called Circus Magazine that I became managing editor of in 19, I think it was 70, for about a year. And Jesus, I would write about that is lot, the most I would, amazing I would write time. About a lot of the, yeah, yeah, I would write about a lot of the uh, you know magazine too because we didn't have a budget for. A lot. So so they uh, they they uh, there's about 20 of my pieces that are on this website there, and I look back at them and it's like oh my god. You know, I never rewrote anything. It was just all stream of consciousness. I love Whatever it. Whatever was in my head at the time, you know, get it done so I could go out and try to meet somebody, you know, at a, at a, at a bar somewhere, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just, uh, you know, some of them make me cringe. I, I take writing much more seriously uh, now at this point in my life. But, but, you know, in those days, the idea of personal journalism was fine. You had people in New York Magazine like Tom Wolfe who were kind of breaking through boundaries of what was an acceptable narrative. And the Rolling Stone writers would often write in the first person. And you could just sort of, you know, just, uh, you know, they're, 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 and, 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 you know, there was no Internet then. So people were buying magazines and there were a, a lot of them. Uh, and uh, you could, you know, that, that, that's the period in which people like Lester Bangs and Richard Meltzer and Nick Tosh's, you know, emerged, you know, with, with very personal styles. So I was nowhere near as good a writer as any of those guys, but I, I, uh, I was committed to the idea of being real. And, uh, well, you know, that's, can... uh, that's something I still try to do in my, in my writing and in life. It's, it's the only kind of way I know how to connect with people. I mean, first of all, I, you know, going back, starting my journey nine years ago on the radio, I, I, I cringe when I, listen back when I didn't really have my voice and I am trying to tell these great uh, masters of music you know I'm trying I know what I want to ask but I'm too insecure to say it but can you talk about a specific personal journalism uh, Danny Goldberg stream of consciousness riff that stands out maybe it's not something you necessarily look at now as one of the greatest things but at the time it actually got good feedback on it like you said people would write in make comments I mean I love the whole idea of Everything is so scripted today, and we hang, hang on all these words, and we live in this litigious society where everything has to be, you know, sort of vetted, and then, you know, there's this headbutting over mincing of words, you know, and, and it's like, just tell me about, in 1970, something that you can hang on to that you remember where it just flew through you from the heavens. Well, listen, first of all, again, I, I push back on any notion that things are not as good today as they were at any other time, because it's all one. It's all part of one reality. You know, I'm a be here now guy. And the, the, the present moment is always so filled with insecurity and uncertainty and worry. And the past always looks so polished and perfect because it's, it's, it's static and, 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 you know, encased in the amber of, of one of the, the high points for me was in the, is that I interviewed Van Morrison, um, uh, you know, in between the release of Astral Weeks and, um, you know, no, right after, um, uh, um, uh, uh, 
what was it? Oh God, uh, you know the the breakthrough album. Oh, was, uh, the, uh, the the uh, uh, honey honey. Uh, what was it called here? I'll look no, up. it was before Tupelo Honey. Tupelo was, Honey. Uh, yeah, no, that's not what I was thinking of. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Saint Dominic's Preview or. No, no, it was before that. Uh, I'll, I'll moon dance, that. moon dance, moon dance. Yeah, yeah. Just moon dance had just come out, and uh, I was just a huge fan of his. I'd seen him play at the Cafe of Go Go and reviewed him for Record World, another trade magazine I worked for when Astro Weeks was out, and there were like twelve people in the club, and it was like <laughs> unbelievable honor to just sit there and so watch cool, him man. sweating and in this ridiculous satin Nehru shirt he was wearing and singing the songs from from Astral Weeks and uh, and I met his manager and she thought he would like me and I, I went up he was at that time living in Woodstock and, and, and did an interview with him that a magazine called Jazz and Pop printed and that was just a transcript of a conversation and I had been to Woodstock I was asking him about that and what do you think of hippies and you know uh, that was really an actual conversation with a genius uh, that that to me was the first real you know connection where I was talking to someone that I admired that much and he was talking to me and, and, and having a real conversation and and I just printed every word he said that was the article it was q and I didn't dare try to put any any narrative into it and then the other thing that I remember from maybe the next year is when I was at the uh, circus is that you know you're always being pitched by publicists on different artists to talk to and i had to fill up space and i would do some so somehow i i interviewed um john mclaughlin who later you know i uh, cannot you know, believe you did of, i just uh, i just want to have vishnu orchestra you know i've, I've interviewed and, john yeah no i, would, I just want to say the, the name i just wrote down was alan douglas did you know him i met alan many times okay. yeah, i wasn't close friends with him but I met him a zillion times. We knew a lot of people in common. Okay, go ahead. I just I wrote that name taste. down, and he was the one that put out some of the early McLaughlin albums that you know before Mahavishnu, which is it's amazing. And that might have been where I met him. It might have been Alan Douglas yeah. switching me on. And Mahavishnu then switches over, and they're on a major label, and they invented jazz fusion, and exactly. it's a great one of the great guitar players of the generation. But the thing about about uh, John, because he wasn't called Mahavishnu yet, was he was into uh, Hindu mysticism, and he had a guru named Sri Chinmoy. And we just, he would just start talking to me about meditation and about, you know, kind of spiritual matters. And, and, and we developed, like, again, it was like an actual conversation. And I would, then I would always try to interview him whenever he put out a record, and we would just resume the conversation. And it validated for me, you know, that if somebody could be in a band and be a great musician and, you know, like jam with Jimi Hendrix or people like that, that... That that you know, but but is still trying to think about uh, you know things like meditation and being a vegetarian and kind of meaning of life stuff. It it, it was so important to me as a as a role model. I, I I'm sure he wouldn't remember, but I I was just so um, enamored, and he was so um, uh, humble the way he would talk. You know, he just he didn't have any rock star stuff about him at all. So those were just two things that meant a lot to me personally, and then finally. You know, the, these folkies, I felt I was a champion for this little scene. You know, Dylan had moved on. Folk wasn't cool anymore. But I just thought Loudon Wainwright III was like one of the greatest artists I'd ever seen. And to, to, have, uh, to have been able to uh, write a review that was sort of quoted in ads for his first album. And then to this day, I'm a fan of Loudon's. And, of course, now one of, ironically, one of my clients for the last 10 years has been his daughter, Martha Wainwright, who wasn't even born then, but who's an incredible artist in her own own right so you know those are some connections from them that as we are speaking now in the moment pop into my mind you know the thing that i kind of usually am asked about in co talks like this is woodstock because i reviewed the woodstock festival for well i don't, I don't want to go that we're we're, we're, we're only no we're only listen the reason you just what well, just went down me writing down Alan Douglas's name a minute before you mentioned John McLaughlin, and just so you don't think I'm just blowing hot air, I want to put this. You think that the cycle of, like you just said, every time be here now, every time is 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 every time has its own cherished things. What you did every time that you had those cyclical conversations with John McLaughlin, I picked up on that lineage in this century and i want to play this for you right now and have you and just have you listen to this and recognize that um that this is this is this is ultimately why i do my show so take a listen 
discipline uh, of meditation and uh, yogic practices. And at some point, uh, probably about a year after I became a disciple uh, of Sri Chin Moy, um, I mean, uh, things were going very well. I'd already, uh, Mahavishnu Walkers was running. I mean, we were enjoying just phenomenal success. Um, not, I mean, not just musically, but commercially, too. This was the biggest surprise of all. And one day, uh, my Guruji, he, he, he said, so, you know, uh, Mahavishnu, uh, you know, the, the disciples need to, need to eat a good meal and cheap. So why don't you open a restaurant? <laughs> and so so that, that's what I did. And, uh, oh, and it was in Queens. And, um, and, and that's why I learned to cook uh, Indian food. <laughs> you know, uh, not very well, but I got better. I, I, I cannot wait to have... I, wait, hold on for a second. Did you... I love to do it. Yeah, um, go ahead. The thing, but the thing is, it was, it was, you know, I had to make basically a good meal for a dollar fifty, and uh, even in you know, 1972, uh, that's that's a tough call. And basically, so I was, I was just losing money every month. <clears throat> but it was, it was what I, what I considered part of my divine duties, for want of another word. And and I was very happy to, that 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 you know it, it helped people who didn't have much money to come and eat very cheap and good food, vegetarian. In any event, uh, I kept it going for about t two years and uh, but it got it got heavy for me in the sense that <laughs> I really couldn't take care of it. I was touring all the time and, and so I had to allocate um, you know, responsibility to different people and uh, and in the end, <clears throat> uh, after a couple of years, I, I, I said to my guru, I said, Guruji, I, I'm, I'm really having a problem <laughs> with this, you know. <clears throat> and he said, well, it's okay. He said, you know, you've, you've learned enough, I think, from that experience. And, I, and so I gave it away, actually. <laughs> the first one, <laughs> I gave it to him. That's, an inter that's my fourth interview with Johnny from March of 2018. Nice. And I just want to say that, that what you did in 1970s, which really gave you, I mean, I don't know, did he ever talk to you about the restaurant that he had to buy, that Indian restaurant? No, no, it must have, it must have been before that. Uh, oh, no, it was. Or, the, the, or I must have, or I could have. No, let me tell you something. It's, I, it, I didn't it, recall that. You know, but you know what's funny is because I've interviewed all the guys in the band, so I, I played John a clip of Jerry Goodman, who was the violin player in the original Mahavishnu, and he talked about playing acoustic raga music on this floor of the Indian restaurant. And here it is. I think what you said before, it just it made the hair on my arm stand up. It, it was a larger purpose than just commodifying the music. I mean, John was a spiritual character. He came to New York. The vibration was so high. He got into yoga. He found his teacher. And he's about, and, and they are out after the first album, commercially having a lot of success as the Mahavishnu Orchestra and Sri Chimnoy says, John, the disciples need to eat. Please buy please rent a restaurant and start cooking vegetarian Indian food. And he did it. I mean that to me is the mo one of the most inspiring stories. So from you in the seventies to now, the cycle, Danny, continues, man. I just and I and I don't I'm not trying to jive you. I'm just trying to say that like it's really beautiful that you were chronicling that in the real time. Because that is, that to me is what is, for better or for worse, it's, um, man, I don't know how to say this, but, you know, we just have reached a point where I think it's great that Tower of Power and Steve Miller and Journey can go out and make millions of dollars on, on summer tour playing regurgitated hits that, you know, that the baby boomers want to hear. But I don't know, I mean, where's the commercial viability for people that are doing completely new music? I mean, my vision orchestra was, they, Oh, come on. I don't, man, you know, how old are you? I'm 42. You're going to tell me that, 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 that creatives are able to survive in the music biz today. I think geniuses are, I think most people who want to be artists can't make a living doing it. And by the way, that's always been the way it was. You know, that's why there was that cliche of the starving poet. You know, that wasn't created yesterday. That's a, that's a, that's an archetype that goes back. I did. You know, centuries. I, I, I did. But uh, I, I, I did. I, 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 
personal way of communicating that like connects with the whole world it, with a musical sound that's not like anything else that's successful. It doesn't happen to be my music because again, I'm an old fart who listens to old. No, music, I, I don't but, think I, I think that's but, a cop out. I, I I really I really think it's a cop out because no, no, it's not. It's a truth. It's 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 a biological truth, man. You have a different brain for hearing music when you're a teenager than any other time in your life. There's an imprinting that goes on. There's this movie made of people with Alzheimer's where they go and they're not speaking at all and they put on headphones, they play them one song, no reaction, another song, no reaction. Then they play some Glenn Miller song and the, and the people light up and start singing along because it connects with something from when they were young and suddenly come out of their dark, you know, Alzheimer's dementia shell. I, I just think that, that there's incredible stuff going on. And if you want to know about it, talk to a teenager. Talk to a really smart teenager, and they'll tell you what's going on. No, 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 no. It's, it's not even about it. I know that there's amazing stuff going on, but there's a supply and demand issue at this point. There are no touring circuits anymore. There are no venues well, anymore. there's no touring. And, and, well, and so no what venues. I'm saying is like, the and they're... During the coronavirus, no. Well, I'm no, no, but all, I mean, let's, I mean... Virus or you mean before that? Um... Man, I got to tell you, I am, you know, like, um, I mean, we, Danny, we have to do part two uh, because this is, we've already stretched, like, I, and, and actually, I really love you, because, you know, pushing back because you lived through the time. I'm just saying Randy Brecker lived in a, in a loft in the West Village for $400 a month, and he could make that in one week using radio registry in New York City as a studio musician. The crushing cost of living and the significance of music has changed completely in our culture. And there are badass musicians, young cats all over the place. That they, they, It is unsustainable now. John, and all I'm saying is that it's not that there isn't talent. But I do want you to think about this. As... <laughs> your, listen, your friend John Perry Barlow, you know, was complicit in this. This whole idea of, of, of eliminating the value of copyright. Oh my, dude, he Goldberg, so we are uh, Goldberg. Let's get part two going. I love jousting with you, man. It's, it, this is I, 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 I got another interview right now. But can we do can we All do right, set two? Yes, let's uh, email me. We'll figure it out. It's a really a thrill to talk to you. You're alive and smart, and it means a lot to me. Have a great yeah. Love always, man. Be safe, we'll, man. We'll, we'll continue. All right, bye, man. Bye. Be cool. And we'll be right back with Taylor Rose right after this. <laughs> 